We've been looking at the feast that the Lord proclaimed in Leviticus 23. And we've dealt with all of them yesterday, coming to the Feast of Tabernacles at the end. And so where do you go then in the last session? Well, there are two more Jewish holidays, and that's Purim in the book of Esther, chapter 9, and the Feast of Hanukkah in John, chapter 10, verse 22. But they don't carry prophetic sanctioning. They don't have a prophetic development. So we won't go there because I think that's not quite fitting for what we're doing today. But what I want to do is look at one of those other chapters in Leviticus, your favorite book and mine, because within this book there is a, a parasha, a, a, a section, the, the Jewish people divided the Bible up into sections, not into chapters. We have chapters. They had parasha, divisions. And so there's a division called Bahar. Uh, it means on the mountain. And it's found in Leviticus 25. And so it's only a couple of chapters on. And so I want you to turn there with me. And it deals with basically two concepts. Special years, and that fits with us because we're dealing with special days. And the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. And so the significance of this passage starts off right at the beginning. The Lord then spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai saying, you got to stop then and say, hang on, why is he repeating that? We know he's at Mount Sinai. What's the big deal? Forgive me. Isn't, isn't it like, don't we know that? Didn't he give already the Ten Commandments and did he tell us he was there? But he's drawing our mind back to that, saying, this is like that. This is as significant as those ten words. And he's drawing our attention, saying, hey, pay attention here. And what he's doing here is giving those two special years, the sabbatical year, uh, in Hebrew, Shemitah, and the Yovel, the Jubilee year. Uh, those two words you don't need to remember, it's not so significant. And throughout this study, you'll see some Hebrew. Just ignore that. Uh, we'll talk around that. But I want you to, to start hearing some of that. Because when you meet the Lord on the year of release, he'll be speaking to you and saying, Shalom. And not, G'day, mate, how you going? <laughs> I want you to, to be aware of some of that Jewish background. And that comes out here. And so there are two key words that I want you to grasp. Dror, liberty, release, to set free. And that's that key word that we have in this text. Think about it for a second. Dror. Colossians 2, 13 to 14. And you who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of your trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us in its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. That's that word that gives us that liberty. He set us at liberty, not because we, but he. Not what we've done, but what he did by nailing it to the cross. What did he nail? The record that stood against us. That other word that you see, chofesh, uh, chinam, is a related word, meaning completely set free. There is no hanging on to something from previous. And so the slave was to be set completely free without any obligation to its master. Romans 8.2. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free, in Messiah Jesus, from the law of sin and death. So we are not bound to it anymore. John 8, 36. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. It is that complete release that you have at that point. And those two words play in this chapter. And so I want you to, to pick that up. Because we've been set free by him, completely released from the law, so that we now can serve him only. That's that point. And because he has set us free, we are truly free. So as I mentioned, this has three 
key themes, uh, the sabbatical year, Hebrew Shemitah, your fellows to Jubilee, and the Goel, the kinsman of Redeemer, in this chapter. So if you have the Bible with you, and I hope you do, I'll start reading. Most, then the Lord spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I shall give you, and the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord, six days you shall sow your field, and the six years you shall, you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its crops. But during the seventh year the land shall have a Sabbath, a rest, a Shabbat, a rest to the Lord. You shall not Sow your field, nor prune your vineyard. Your harvest of after growth, you shall not reap it. And your grapes of untrimmed vines, you shall not gather it. The land shall have its sabbatical year. All of you shall have the Shabbat products of the land for the food for yourself, and your male, and your female slave, and your hired worker, and the foreigner, the resident who is among you. Even your cattle and animals that are in your land shall have all its crop to eat. I'm a city slicker, I, I confess. I, I've, I've been on the countryside once in my life and I looked and I felt very uncomfortable. Open spaces, it scares me. <laughs> I know some of you do like them, but, but having grown up in the city, it, it's, it's very different. And I'm trying to imagine that if I was a farmer back in those days, how would I feel? You see, we, we talk about rotational crops, and I, I see that in the newspaper, rotational crops, and I, I get that, that concept. But here we're told, six years you may work in your fields, and then on the seventh, don't do anything about it. It's not just for you, but it's for everybody else. Uh, if I was a landowner, I would say, hang on, that's one-seventh of my income gone. Uh, hang on, these strangers may come in and eat it. Even my animals, when they get onto that field, they can take it. Uh, are you sure? <laughs> because that's a heavy loss of income, and that's risky, because if you don't have a full bumper crop the year before, you're in trouble. And so it either creates in you the anxiety that I would feel, or it builds faith. And so there's a faith building amongst the faithful, but amongst those that are not, an anxiety producing time to come. The year of release. The Sabbath for Israel as in an individual relationship was a great equalizer. The king took a day off, not the priest, they had to work, but everybody had a day off, whether you were poor or rich, wealthy, made no difference. Everybody was the same. So here too, there's an equalizing in terms of the land. <coughs> everybody is in the same boat. Nobody can harvest. If you live in a wealthy area, you, you'll probably do okay, but if you live in a poor area, and when you think about the land of Israel, the north, north of Jerusalem, that's, that's okay, that's green. There's a lot of rain coming from the Mediterranean. But south of Jerusalem, there's the Judean wilderness and the Negev, and it's dry, and it's a risky proposition. Do you want to do this? And so, where do you stand? Would you do that? Would you say, well, I'll, I'll let my slaves harvest the crop and eat from it. Think about what it did for them. They can go in and take what they need. So they can build up some wealth and they can build up some reserve for the years to come because they can sell it on. In Exodus 23:11, it says, and the poor of your people shall eat of it. And so the produce that was made at this time just by God himself, not by you sowing, not by anything else, it was for them primarily. It was every seventh year. I'm not one for numbers, I'm mathematically challenged, but that number seems to come back over and over again, doesn't it? Number seven. The opening statement in Genesis is seven words. In the beginning, God... No, wait. In Hebrew, it does work. 
Bereshit bara Elohim at Shmaim at Haaretz. God said this time apart. Uh, there are seven days, uh, six days to work, seventh day to rest. Uh, my grandfather Jacob, he worked for his bride for seven years and then got cheated by his uncle and he had to work another seven years. Uh, Laban and Jacob. Uh, there is the seven-branched menorah. There's seven holy seasons and two of them have seven holy days. Consistently this comes back. Even in the New Testament we see that there are seven I am statements in John by Jesus. There are seven signs. There are seven churches and Brother Morris is going to talk about that. There are seven stars and seven seals and seven bowls and seven trumpets and, and consistently that comes back. The number seven generally means um, completeness, not perfection but completeness. Uh, we know it's not perfection because uh, the Antichrist too in, in Revelation uh, 12 and 13 is described as having seven heads and we wouldn't say he's, yeah, so completion. This completes a whole thing. So God sets this time apart for Israel, those seven years, and says that's one cycle for you. Then he continues in verses 5 to 38. And that goes a little bit beyond our time to read all of that. But you are to count of seven Sabbaths of years, and you shall count for yourself seven times seven years, so that you have time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely 49 years. Okay, seven cycles of seven, and then there's a Sabbath here. Great. Verse 10. And you shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim release throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a yoval, a jubilee unto you. Each of you shall return to his own property and each of you shall return to his own family. Hang on. God initially says on the seventh year I've got to release the land. Now... If I have bought somebody else's land, what do I have to do? Release it back to them. Really what I have is a lease, not a sale. Because God wanted the tribes to have individual inheritance and it could not be sold outside of the tribe. Later on that became a little bit more narrowly defined within the families, within the clans of Israel. And so at this point again they are told you cannot sow, you cannot reap. Uh, what is growing there is food for everybody. And, and again, uh, I think of the farmer at this point, and I go, uh, on the seventh year I had to stop working, but now I've got to do it again. So that's two years in a row. Now academics, I worked in an academic institution for a long time, they, they take a year off, and really what they do is they study somewhere else for a year. So it's not really a year off, but that's okay. But a whole land is now not just one year, but two years at rest. That's a risky proposition. Even amongst the faithful, you now need a double bumper crop the year before. Because that now needs to last for almost three years. How faithful would God need to be to make that happen? He just needs to be faithful, that's who he is. How faithful would I need to be to believe that and to live that and to practice that at that time? I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm glad at that point I am not part of Israel. But why is this? Verse 23. The land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. And you, Israel, are but aliens and sojourners with me. This is God's land, not their land. They are just but aliens. We never think of Israel as being an alien in the land, isn't it? See, that geography of holiness comes back. It is his land, nobody else's. And they may divide it up, they may sell it, they may do whatever they want. But bottom line, it's still not their land. They are only leasing. God is leasing it to them temporarily, saying, hey, this is here for you. So 
at this point, all the slaves had to be set free. Uh, we kind of like that release, the, the debt release. And we, we sometimes see in Christian circles that they, they proclaim the year of Jubilee, a year of release. And different people proclaim different years and different denominations proclaim different years. Uh, the reality is nobody knows when the year of Jubilee is. Why? Because search as you may throughout the Old Testament, you will not find another record of this. You will not find throughout the scriptures that they ever observed this. And so the rabbis wrote very early on that from Moses up to the rabbis, they didn't keep it. Well, we know from the time of the rabbis to now, they didn't keep it either. So how would you calculate when this is? Yet there are many people who are calculating this somehow. It's like pulling a rabbit out of a head, I think. It's not possible to do that. I think what we need to learn from it is the principle, not the legalism trying to figure out when that day is and then observing that day. That, I think, is the key for us. It is said that Jesus, when he was in the synagogue at Nazareth in Luke 4, 16 to 22, um, that he opened the scroll of Isaiah and he read Isaiah 61 and that he was reading that in the year of Jubilee. And there is a connection that could be made there. Uh, that's true, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And, and the connection is there, but I'm not quite comfortable to say that it was. Our text continues, verse 35. And in verse 35, it now changes because God realized that the people, when they were released, uh, were still poor. And what would you do when you're poor? You sell yourself to somebody who can look after you. Now, we think that's a horrible thing, and rightly so, because we think of modern-day slavery Modern-day slavery is not like biblical slavery. Uh, the same word for servant is the same word for slave. It's not quite the same. Uh, you couldn't beat them because then they could take you to court. They had rights. So here in this section, he talks about the goel, the kinsman redeemer. And if you're familiar with the book of Ruth, Boaz plays that out. And that would be a whole story by itself apart from here. But let me read a few verses. Now in case a countryman of yours becomes poor and his means with regard to you falter, then you are to sustain him like a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with you. Do not take usury interest from him, but revere your God that your countrymen may live with you. And you shall not give him your silver at interest, nor your food for gain. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. If your countryman of yours becomes poor with regard to you, that he sells himself to you, you shall not subject him to a slave's service. Now, the word here would be the bottom rank of a servant. He shall be with you as a hired man, as he were a sojourner. And he shall serve with you until the year of release. What does that mean? Let's say I'm poor. I lost my house. My family abandoned me. I'm living on the street. I go to Pastor Jeff and I say, Pastor Jeff, I'm going to sell myself as a servant to you. And he says, okay. And he then takes on the responsibility of looking after me. And I do all of the tasks for him. Now, if I was very young and I also had kids, they, they would be in slavery forever. But every Israelite, every Jewish family would have that opportunity to be free in one stage in their life. And so during the year of Jubilee, all of them would be set free. Now, to a large degree, that also happened during the sabbatical year because often they would sell themselves only for a period of time. But if he loved his master so much, and I would do that with Pastor, no worries, he would pierce the ear and, and put an X through it, 
and I would be a permanent slave. But even then, in this year, the year of Jubilee, I would be set free. So everybody is set free. That's the key for us. Don't give him money for interest because God wants us to train in acts of righteousness. Don't take gain from him when, you, when he cannot repay it. We tend to say, what's in it for me? But God is saying, no, look after the poor, the orphan, the widow, because they too are a part of God's people. Verse 47, if a stranger or a sojourner with you becomes rich and your brother beside him becomes poor and sells himself to the stranger who is not under this law, the sojourner with you and a member of a stranger's clan, then after he is sold, he may be redeemed. One of his brothers may redeem him or his uncle or his cousin may redeem him or a close relative from his clan may redeem him. Or if he grows rich, he may, re he may redeem himself. And so if he could take during the sabbatical years enough to save a little bit of money, he could possibly redeem himself. But if not, one of your fellow members may redeem him. Okay, that, that makes sense. But you've got to love somebody pretty well to say, hey, I'll buy you out. Because who are you buying out? Somebody who has no money and therefore needs support. Again, that book of Ruth that uh, falls within that. Um, Boaz initially is described as a distant relative. He doesn't have to, but he chooses to. And so he chooses to do this. In this chapter, three times God says, do this because I am the Lord your God, in verse 17, 38, and 55. And three times he tells them, remember, you are the strangers, I am the Lord, you're going to do this because I'm telling you, I am your father. There's a prophetic development that continues here. Turn with me to Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 32, we can see a prophetic development. Uh, Jeremiah is the prophet who predicted the exile and who said, hey, uh, things are going to go from bad to worse. The Babylonians are coming. Uh, uh, life is over here. And he lived at a time when the kings of Israel were particularly bad. They were unfaithful to God and they refused to listen to God. Uh, even though God had said this is going to happen, they still refused to listen. And then God initially starts talking to Jeremiah and he says, hey, your cousin Hanamel is coming and he wants you to buy his land at Anatot. Uh, if you were Jeremiah, you would have said, Hang on, Lord, you just told me I was going to go into exile for 70 years and you want me to buy his land? It is of no value to me. Why would you want me to buy his land? Nevertheless, God spoke to him, and so his cousin then comes to him and he says, Buy my field, that is, I told him, the land of Benjamin. For the right of possession and redemption, the kinsman redeemer concept, is yours. Then I, that is Jeremiah, knew that it was the word of the Lord, verse 9. And I bought the field at Anatot from Hanamel, Hanamel, my cousin, and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. And then I took the sealed deed of the purchase, containing the terms and the conditions, and the open copy. And at that point, he gives that sealed and that open copy to his scribe, Baruch, who then puts it in a clay jar. Um, a little bit like the, the clay jars that we found at the Qumran site. And I'm, I'm kind of secretly hoping that we will find this, because he said, this will be there for a long time. Uh, when he's talking about, in verse 14, that, it, that that may last for a long time, it is for the exile period. We probably won't find it. But there is that promise that this will happen again. What? That houses and fields and vineyards may once again be bought in the land. And he has that prayer and he says, 
After I had given the deeds of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Our Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm, and nothing is too hard for you, even though with my own eyes I don't see how this can be, and even though I will never see it myself. Hmm. I wonder if we would have done that, whether we would have given him that money. 17 shekels is a fair amount of money. This is a, a, a fair amount that you would have been saving up a lot for, and it is now valueless to you. The text goes on, and we won't deal with it, but if you have your time, I want you to read it to verse 44. And you see that uh, eventually Jeremiah ends up in jail. He's thrown up in jail, and, and he's getting a hard time. Uh, He's not having a good time. He's put in jail uh, because he cried out that God was coming and judging the nation of Israel. But here he is, the kinsman redeemer of the land, not of the people. That is in the book of Ruth. But here he's the redeemer of the land. If you were Jeremiah, would you have done that? Would you have said, I'll spend my money? I don't know. I, I think I would have taken some financial advice and said, is this a good deal? <laughs> His cousin is unfaithful. The generation is unfaithful. Israel is unfaithful. And here you stand as a faithful man, throwing money to the wind. But Jeremiah is acting out a prophetic aspect of this, just as Boaz is. Boaz redeems Naomi and Ruth. Jeremiah redeems the land. Both those two concepts come back. Let's look at Revelation in chapter 5. I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Jeremiah had a scroll with seals on it. It was the purchase deed of the land. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals. To be the kinsman redeemer, you had to be an, a man of valor, it says in, in uh, Ruth chapter 2 of Boaz, uh, often translated as a man of wealth, but it is this concept that is coming back here. Who is worthy to open the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look in it. And then I began to weep because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. John is acting out here as a servant, as a slave, saying, hey, we need to be redeemed and the land needs to be redeemed. And then one of the elders said, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the scroll with its seven seals. The line indicates kingliness, stateliness. He's from the tribe of Judah, from which the king would come, and he's from the root of David, the offspring of David. Uh, again, all of that is emphasizing his kingship, his right and of, of authority is there. All of that comes back at this point. And this is in contrast to the prince of the air, who doesn't have that right uh, because he didn't have that kingship. He didn't purchase us. He didn't redeem us. Verse 6, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God 
sent out into all the world. And he came and he took the scroll out of my right hand of him. Sorry. And, I, and he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. The one who would redeem needed to be able to do it. He needed to be willing to do it. He needed to have the money to do it. Well, the one who is here, who is now coming into picture, is not the lion, the king. But it is the one who redeemed us, the lamb, slain. He is the one who will redeem. This is now coming back together. When he had taken the scroll, the 24 living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each of them holding a harp and bowls full of, golden in, sorry, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood man from every tribe and tongue and people and nations. And you've made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God. And they will reign upon the earth. The kinsman redeemer out of Leviticus 25 who will redeem people and land is described here. Like Jeremiah, he did a part. Like Boaz, who did a prophetic part. He the Messiah. What will he redeem? People. Jew and Gentile, from every nation, every tribe, every tongue. But that includes you and me. And he then commissions us, doesn't he? We don't become pew-sitters. He commissions us. It is so significant that we connect that. And then he calls us to reign. Where? Upon that which he has redeemed also, namely the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands upon, and thousands, upon thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. All of it belongs to Him. None of it belongs to us. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and underneath the earth and under the sea and all things in them I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Friends, that prophetic development is here now. Some of this is still future. We know that. Uh, this comes after the tribulation period. Uh, when we go into the millennial kingdom, all of us will stand there and worship. And so he clarifies what our calling is. Yes, we are to be a kingdom of priests, just like Israel of old, so too we are called to be that. So what is it that we do? He repeats this for us, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb. To some degree, we need to sing that on a regular basis because we, the redeemed, have been saved by Him. And one day He will redeem the heavens and the earth. He's already paid for it. It's just this delay that we have now. God drew our attention right at the beginning of Leviticus 25 that those were the words said on the mountain. But it was on another mountain that he saved humanity, Mount Moriah, just as he had foreshadowed in Genesis 22. And the kinsman redeemer would come, Leviticus 25, to redeem you and me from all nations, all tribes, Friends, that will be the year of release. You and I have been released, and we've now been called to be priests. In other words, 
to administer that which he's done for us. In other words, go and declare that this is the year of Jubilee. Father, I want to thank you that you've sent your son, the Lord Jesus, the kinsman redeemer, not just to Israel and just to the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, but that your son foreshadowed in Boaz and Jeremiah would redeem all of mankind, that he would redeem all of the earth, Father, help us to be worthy now and to respond and give glory to the Lamb who came and is our kinsman redeemer, our Savior. Lord, help us to declare that this is the year of release. This is the year of jubilee to those that are not yet in the kingdom that they may perceive that one day he will come and when he will break those seals It'll be hardship. Father, help us to perceive that. Help us to give glory to the Lamb forever and ever. In Jesus' name.